Serious. Psychiatrists slash psychologists, what is the most profound or insightful thing you have ever heard from a patient with a mental illness? Story 1. I guess I miss a transition from when the ground was lava and imaginary friends became schizophrenia. Story 2. The most meaningful thing I've heard was a guy telling his hallucinations that he thinks he can trust me. Story 3. I work with a child, 11 years old, who has been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, and I was having a conversation about how it affects interpersonal communication. I was fumbling through explaining nonverbal cues, misunderstandings, etc., when he said to me, It's like trying to explain color to someone who's colorblind. Story 4. My arms miss you. 10-year-old autistic boy asking for a hug. <laughs> oh man, some of these are going to make me tear up, aren't they? Fans of the channel know I'm a sucker for sweet stories. Story 5. Feeling pain is better than feeling nothing. This came from a teenager in juvenile hall upon returning from a psychiatric hold for self-injurious behaviors. I was part of his treatment team in the hall and had to make the 5150 call. He explained during our session that this was the reason for banging his head against a steel door. He couldn't feel anything, no sadness, no joy, nothing. He needed to feel. He chose pain. Story 6. Better to be smarter than you look than look smarter than you are. Story 7. I was always afraid of dying as a child and being forgotten, but now I'm terrified of dying mentally and emotionally and leaving an empty husk, so only I will have forgotten to attend my funeral. Story 8. The medication made the voices go away. I'm lonely now. Story 9. I'm a cannibal investigator. How crazy is it that I have that job? You'd think someone could just go up to these people and say, Hey you, quit eating people. A schizophrenic woman with delusions that she was working for the FBI investigating cannibals. Also believed her twin sister was trying to steal her identity. After about a week of treatment, she still had the same delusions, but was no longer really concerned with them. Completely aware of the absurdity of her supposed profession. Still thought her sister was trying to steal her organs, but she was fine with going to live with her because she was otherwise really a nice person. One of my recent ones, he said it nonchalantly, not trying to brag, just having a conversation, mostly to himself. Yeah, I'm the supreme ruler of the universe. Figure I'd come down here for a bit and hang out. Not really sure that was the right choice, but I'm gonna stick it out. This is what I imagine gets really tough working with people like this, because it genuinely makes sense to them, at least enough so that they believe it. It's like, how do you tell someone their brain is lying to them without them thinking you're lying? My heart goes out to these people. Story 10. From a patient with schizophrenia who had been dismissed by several doctors as she was uncooperative. Yet with me, she communicated well and contributed. So I asked her, why does she think it didn't work with the other doctors? With eerily focused clarity, she said, Do you think we are stupid? We know who really wants to help us. Before going back to entertaining her hallucinations. Story 11. Worked with someone with very rough impulse control and no mother and abusive father. You don't understand. You have people who love you. Nobody loves me except you. Wrecked me emotionally and still hurts. Story 12. I feel like a ghost walking around unseen in the backdrops of these other happy lives. 56-year-old alcoholic. Story 13. A patient recovering from body image issues told me, We spend our lives trying to get to a certain place or acquire certain things so that we may be happy, but true happiness is when you realize you are never going to get to that place, or that even when you do, you will still be dreaming of a new place or new things. So happiness has to start now with what we have. Basically sums up the whole message of therapy for me, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna lie, that, not only was that a pretty darn profound thing to read, I think it was something I kind of needed to read personally. Sorry, maybe a little too real for these videos, but damn. Story 14. You don't get a get well card for depression. People don't see it as an illness. Story 15. Worked with a schizophrenic paranoid patient before. I never thought I was a crazy person until someone told me I was. Story 16. One time I had a client tell me, why should I spend the best 8 hours of the day, the best 40 hours of the week, and the best days of year working? Really gave me something to think about. Story 17. It doesn't take talent to practice. Therapist here. I was working with a defiant teenager and sports was his only outlet. He had big dreams of being in a professional league, but knew he was horrible at it. I thought his statement was really inspiring. I think about it often when trying new things. 
God damn, I came into this thread thinking we were going to read some real, uh, well, a lot of our usual stuff. Looks like we're finding some gems here. Story 18. Psychologist here, working in a high-security environment with women, a very insightful and high-functioning female patient explained, your belief in mental illness is the exact same as that woman's, points to a psychotic patient, belief in whatever it is she thinks is real. You both use it as a way to cope, a way to organize your version of reality, yet it's no more closer to truth than the others. It's all invented, it's all immeasurable, it's all equally wrong. What about love? Maybe if she was loved differently, she'd know how to love differently and she would be different. Maybe if you guys, therapists, would drop the crap and just love differently, things will change for the better. I haven't been the same since. Story 19. One person I will always remember was the most paranoid schizophrenic girl I'd ever met. She was extremely sick, about my age at the time, late 20s. She had a lot of anger, obviously, and was constantly afraid. I worked with her individually for months through multiple hospitalizations, and I remember the day we had the huge breakthrough that she was able to sit in a chair in my office and feel safe there. The last time I ever saw her, she looked at me, and in a moment of what seemed like real clarity, she said, Maybe in another life we could be friends. I told her I'd like that. I had really tried so hard to help her. For someone so paranoid who was so afraid and distrustful to say that to me, I felt like crying. Story 20. Imagine if every small decision felt like it had life or death consequences. Describing living with an anxiety disorder. It's like a life or death game of chess. You have to think ten moves ahead and have a move for every situation in advance. The fear of death gets worse with every possible move you analyze. And if life makes a move that you didn't see coming, instant breakdown, no matter how small and insignificant the move was. Story 21. I want to kill myself, but I don't want to die. Believe it or not, those are two different things. Folks, I've lost people in my life. If you are having a thought like that, contact someone you can trust, family, a professional, whomever. But please reach out. Talk. Story 22. I don't want to kill myself. I want to kill the part of me that wants to kill myself. When I started to make real progress against depression was when I started thinking of the depression as a separate entity that lived in my head, infecting me like a dark, sentient parasite. It gave me something to fight that wasn't me, and something to blame that wasn't me, in a much more concrete and tangible way than mental illness nobody takes very seriously anyway. Story 23. I was interviewing a bipolar patient. I asked him how he would describe himself. An altruistic lover of truth and beauty. I then asked him how others would describe him. Bit of a C, probably. Story 24. I don't know which I'm more afraid of, that one day I'll wake up with the will to kill myself, or that I never do. Story 25. From a patient who suffers from schizophrenia. Why should I take this medication? When I'm under this, I feel so empty. He was full of delusions, thinking he was the reincarnation of God and regularly living the nirvana. Story 26. From a patient with bipolar at a nursing home I worked at when talking about how arbitrary the diagnostic guidelines can be. I don't take my meds to fix me because there's nothing wrong with me. I take them because everyone else is crazy and I need to fit in. Story 27. Patient with schizophrenia described it as spending all day in a locked room with a stereo on full blast and not being able to turn the volume down. I'm not sure how accurate that is or isn't to what most schizophrenics go through, but that's one of the first descriptions I've heard that I can really imagine. That sounds tougher than I thought. Story 28. I had a client with general anxiety disorder. She explained the feeling as if she tripped, and the moment where you don't know if you're going to catch yourself or not is how she felt all day long. I once tried to explain it to a friend and only got as close as when you tap your pocket to get your wallet and it's not there, but as they said, all the time. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. One of my clients had paranoid schizophrenia and he was recovering from yet another in a long string of hospitalizations due to a significant psychotic episode. We were sitting together quietly and there was a lull in the conversation. He suddenly looked up and said, Hey. You know Lord of the Rings? Did you ever think that those books might actually be prophecy? I said, no, I don't think they are. They are really interesting and enjoyable, but they are just made-up stories. Professor Tolkien even said so himself. He seemed to mull this over for a few moments and said, yeah, you're probably right. Sometimes I wonder about things like that, but I have paranoid schizophrenia.
Oftentimes, we talk about an individual's reality testing, which describes an individual's ability to reconcile their inner beliefs with their outer experience. People with poor reality testing due to psychosis, for example, will often have distorted beliefs about the rest of the world. It was great to see a moment of real clarity and self-awareness through this guy's frequent fog of struggle. Story 30. People do drugs to feel less bad. Explaining addiction to non-addicts is really hard. I've said nobody shoots up every day because they really love to party. That's a damned good way to put it. I've known people who struggle with addiction, really struggle, and they were never thrilled about it or life. It's a difficult disease to live with and should be treated as one. Story 31. When I was a med student on psych, I had a schizophrenic patient who said, I know y'all are trying to help me, but other people are pulling me away from you. Story 32. Child with autism who was struggling with her difficulty making keeping friends. It's okay if I don't have any friends. Having friends makes you happy, but it doesn't make you a good person. You know who was really popular? Hitler. This girl was so lonely and it was causing her so much pain, but she still managed to see the difference between being popular and being good. We made a project of finding examples of unpopular people who did really good and important things. She still has a tough life ahead of her, but I think her attitude will help her be strong. Story 33. It isn't sadness. Sometimes, a lot of the time, I just feel like there is a blanket covering me. From head to toe, I'm wrapped up in it. I can't move. I can't breathe. I can't be me. I feel like someone is just wrapping me up and I can't do anything about it. I pretend everything is fine. I act like I'm happy and having a good time, but really, I'm stuck and can't escape. Story 34. I wish I could just stop caring what people thought about me and rid myself of my anxiety, but lying to myself is what got me here in the first place. Story 35. I was rotating through an inpatient psychiatric facility and had a patient who was having a severe manic episode. He would ramble on topics about the occult and conspiracy organizations like the Illuminati, but then told me, you know those things are real, right? They have TV shows about them. And then I realized that some of those ridiculous Discovery and History Channel TV specials were probably validating some of the psychosis our patients had. Story 36. I don't feel like dying, I just really don't feel like carrying on living anymore. Story 37. My face hurts. Six-year-old autistic girl trying to explain that feelings were hurt. That's where she associates feelings. The things that show on people's faces. Story 38. The real me has been asleep for a few years. I hope he'll wake up someday to rescue me. Honestly, a number of these ones are things I think a lot of people can relate to to some degree. It really shows how people going through this stuff shouldn't be othered just because they're dealing with extra difficulties mentally. There but for a few factors go we. Story 39. I pay attention to myself more than other people. I know that sounds selfish, but it's really not. Because the more you pay attention to yourself, the more other people are going to look at you and look at themselves and pay more attention to themselves and care for themselves. You have to want to live a certain way, if not for yourself, then at least for other people. Story 40. That self-termination for this person wasn't a thought they had or a choice they made in the everyday sense of those words. It was a natural urge, like eating when hungry or sleeping when tired. Like those activities that drive to end one's life when under extreme duress is an urge you can fight for a while, but that you will always feel compelled towards as a natural response. I'm not saying I completely agree, but it made perfect sense for her. Story 41. I know of recovery, but I do not know recovery. A man discussing his addiction in a group I was facilitating, talking about telling yourself you're in recovery just because you know the facts and methods. But without putting it into practice, you go nowhere. Story 42. Former mental patient here and current social worker who works with individuals with severe and persistent mental illness. Right before a hospitalization, one of my friends asked what it was like to be mentally ill. For me, it wasn't having control of my own mind. Knowing what I was thinking and doing to myself made no sense, but not being able to stop. It's the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced. I haven't personally gone through that, but I'm glad the OP was willing to share that insight with us. I can't imagine how tough that must have been. Story 43. Therapist intern. Had a 17-year-old autistic client who had been in residential care for years. One day he got teary-eyed and told me that they took away his childhood. Recently, saw a 40-year-old woman. She came to see me because she didn't feel right inside. After a while, I asked her to tell me about the last time she remembered being happy. 
She paused for a long time and said she couldn't remember and wasn't sure if she has ever felt happy. Story 44 The human void must be continually filled, or else had it consumed you. He was explaining that you should fill your life with new experiences and goals and do your best to socialize, or else stagnation, apathy, and lethargy will make you a waste of space and lead you to a black pit of despair. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.